Now, this Lord's Prayer is fascinating to me because it's based on the kingdom idea entirely, isn't it? What word is doubled up in that prayer? Kingdom. Twice a reference to the kingdom in the prayer. Your kingdom come, not your kingdom spread. Now, there's nothing wrong with the church spreading and making an influence in the world, I get that. But it's not your kingdom get bigger by spreading. It's your kingdom arrive, come in the future. That's what's essentially and firstly meant by that phrase. And if you go back to the book of Micah a moment, here's where Jesus had his mind when he was talking about these things. One of many places, I think this is fascinating in terms of the kingdom of God, the story that people didn't learn in church, 4.8. In that day, in that future day of the kingdom, in that day, declares Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, doesn't matter how you pronounce it, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. Isn't that interesting? God always is picking up the pieces, isn't he? It's my own comment now, right? You start with the lame and the crippled and we're going to make them all better. It's from darkness to dawn. That's the pattern. And the Lord will reign over them. There's the kingdom. Where? In heaven. No, no. In Mount Zion. That's Jerusalem. You can tell that the kingdom of God has not come fully. You can go to Jerusalem. Guess what? You won't find the Messiah sitting on the throne of David. Is that clear? The throne of David is never, ever, ever, ever in the sky. Any more than the throne of England is in Moscow. That's not clear to people. This is Mount Zion, Jerusalem. From now on and forever. Of course, that means from then on. You got a point? The Hebrews are so clear about the future, they can say from now on, looking at the picture, right? We would say now, from then on, wouldn't we? Correctly. They say now, because it's so clear to them, from now on in the vision that they're looking at. From then on and forever. As for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, that's Jerusalem, to you it will come, what? Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom, there it is, of the daughter of Jerusalem. That's what Jesus has in mind. When do they really get excited in the New Testament? When Jesus walks down the street and they say, Blessed is the coming kingdom Messiah. Hallelujah. That's what gets them switched on, isn't it? Why isn't it true of the Christian church today? I don't hear this excitement. This Mark 11, 10. It's all about the family of David. The kingdom of the Lord in the hands of the family of David. We read the verses in the Old Testament. The kingdom of the Lord was there in the hands of the sons of David. David is everything. David is mentioned more times than Jesus in the Bible. Not that he's more important. I get that. But the son of David, they're very excited about that. And the thrill of messianic peace in Jerusalem. If you're not excited about that, you're not on Jesus' wavelength yet. If you're still just talking about the kingdom of God in my heart and being a good person, that's the beginning, but it's nowhere near the end of your study. So I think that's fascinating. That's the Lord's Prayer there. You must think like a Jew. Yeah. Jesus was a Jew. Salvation is from the Jews. The oracles of God were not given to the Mexicans or the Brits or the Americans. They were given to Jews. How excited are you about that? We should respect Jews very specially. Now, right now, they're blinded people. and They're not doing well at all because they didn't believe in their Messiah. It's very bad now, the Bible says. It's chaos, but you ain't seen nothing yet. When Jesus comes back, when the Messiah sits on the throne of David, in Jerusalem, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's right there. Your heart is pounding, is it, in excitement? Looking for, oh, how Jewish is that? Jesus was a Jew. You better be very Jewish. Luther, unfortunately, was not. Some people have felt that Luther's anti-Semitism might lie behind the Holocaust, even. You don't want to be anti-Semitic. And people who said the book of Revelation doesn't belong in the canon, they haven't got a clue. I'm going to read verse 9 just to complete the thought here. We're back in Micah still, verse 9. Now, why do you cry out loudly? This is the bad news. Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished? That's the bad news. That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. That's the messianic birth pangs, you see. It's the great tribulation that precedes the coming in the future. Writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, you people, you Jewish people, like a woman in childbirth. That's where you get the idea of birth pangs. Jesus said, these are only the beginning of birth pangs. Birth pangs for the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 
person who can imagine that has got no understanding at all. Do you see that? It's not the birth pangs of 8070 when, when Israel was wiped out. It's birth pangs for the restoration of Israel. So we believe in the restoration of national Israel in the future, absolutely. For the present, we are the Israel of God internationally. We who are true, true believers are the Israel of God. That's not the end of the story. There's a restoration of now blinded ethnic Israel explained here. For now, as to say, now in the future, at that time, you will go out of the city. Dwell in the field. This is the bad news for a moment. Go to Babylon. And there you'll be rescued. They get rescued from Babylon, please notice, right? That means you're going to have to go to Babylon first to be rescued from Babylon. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And now, at that time, many nations have been assembled against you. That's the bad news part of it, right? Many nations against you. International episode here against Israel in the future still to us and then even those enemy nations at that time are going to be converted or at least a remnant of them this is pure politics isn't it and exciting politics those ones who then at that future time will say let her be polluted let our eyes gloat over Zion that's the bad news right that's the great tribulation time coming in the future but they do not know the thoughts of Yahweh they don't know his plans they do not understand his purpose, his plans. For he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise now, speaking positive to Zion, to Israel. Arise and thresh, daughter of Zion. For your, law, for your horn I will make iron, and your hoofs I will make bronze. Horn is an aggressive ruler, too. Israel is going to get vengeance on their enemies. That you may pulverize many peoples. My goodness. That's rather like bring my enemies in front of me and slaughter them. It's the same sort of thing. That you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain. So the enemies, picture here, you're in the future here, you see this. There are enemies of Israel, the great tribulation, time of vengeance, when everything that's written will be fulfilled in Luke 21. God is going to do justice here. You're going to be vindicated. If they've tried to kill you, you're going to be vindicated. A horn of salvation would be a leader. There's a little horn who's Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7. You know that. The little horn. He's the 11th with a series of 10. He's the 11th little horn. He's a bad guy. But it's a leader. In this case, for Jesus, he's the horn of salvation, which means how do we get immortality? A little question like that. You have, of course, the past tense of prophecy, also prophetic past. He has, he's begun to, it's a process, he hasn't finally done it, but that's his intention to set everybody free. I think that's very exciting, that chapter 4 of Micah, and we got there from the Lord's Prayer. Jesus had been meditating, perhaps, on that passage that very day when he gave the Lord's Prayer. 